Good afternoon, everyone. This is Dr. Jeff Gelblum coming to you live from Aventura, Florida, uh, for our bi-weekly, tri-weekly COVID update. Uh, so it's my pleasure to be with you all today. And purpose of today's discussion is to uh, evaluate and really go through the differentiating features uh, of the vaccines uh, that are available to us today. Uh, and many of my patients have already been vaccinated, thank heavens. Certainly those over 65, the vast majority, uh, have already received their vaccines down here in South Florida. Unfortunately, there's a very erratic rollout going uh, throughout the U.S., but down here in South Florida, the bulk of those folks over age 65 have been vaccinated, which is extremely good news. Uh, we healthcare professionals, we doctors uh, and our staff have also been vaccinated because thank heavens, uh, the hospital where I work, Aventura Hospital, made this available uh, to the healthcare providers and uh, the uh, doctor staff. So we got it initially. Uh, and now they are, they are rolling out the vaccine to folks under age 65. As it's standing here in Florida, under 65, in order to be availed of the vaccine, you have to have some significant risk factors as might include a cancer diagnosis, an autoimmune diagnosis, uh, a metabolic diagnosis. So therefore, the uh, rollout has been somewhat uh, stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. And unfortunately, all of those folks who want to get the vaccine can still not access it. Uh, I just read in the newspaper today that President Biden uh, says that all adults will have the opportunity uh, to have at least first shot of vaccine uh, by May. We'll see if that comes to pass. I certainly hope it does. But for the time being, we have to deal with what we've got. So let's talk about the three vaccines that are presently FDA approved uh, for COVID uh, prevention, or I should say COVID illness prevention. Remember, the end point of any uh, vaccine is not to prevent disease. And, and by that, I mean a vaccine is FDA approved to prevent illness associated with a disease. There's no therapeutic endpoint. There's no statistical endpoint. There's no data point that was ever developed in either the Pfizer, the Moderna, or the new J&J &J vaccine to prevent catching coronavirus. That's not what the data endpoints are. That's not what the statistical uh, endpoint of the treatment is. The statistical endpoint, always the statistical endpoint of any drug treatment is the prevention or alleviation of disease. The FDA is very, very clear about that. Medications, as they get approved by the FDA, aren't necessarily preventing a disease. That's okay if that's a, an efficacy endpoint, a point of, of achievement. But by and large, medications are always approved in the clinical setting. It's not to prevent a, a lab test. It's not to prevent a positive test result. It's not to prevent an antibody or to, to, to promote, promote an antibody. That's never how medications are approved by the FDA. Medications, by and large, are approved by the FDA always to prevent a bad clinical endpoint, heart attack, stroke, in this case, COVID illness. So when we look at the data that is available for the three vaccines, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and now the J&J, &J, I want you all to bear in mind that the efficacy endpoint, the treatment endpoint, uh, the, the holy grail of the medicine being approved by the FDA is always to prevent clinical disease, clinical disease. That is your efficacy endpoint all the time. So therefore, when we look at the data from the vaccines, we can't be so bold as to say, oh, it's gonna prevent me from catching the coronavirus. No, what we can be so bold is to say that we can uh, prevent getting sick or getting diseased from the coronavirus. So that is the uniform efficacy endpoint. For those of you who are watching, this is Scooter. He's our trusty service dog. He's sitting on my lap now uh, during the lunch hour because there was banging upstairs. So he needs to get a little comfort like you all do every now and then. So uh, don't pay too much attention to Scooter. He'll pop up and down uh, off of my lap in the course of today's Facebook Live. So getting back to the matter at hand. Uh, COVID vaccine, FDA approved to prevent disease, not to prevent transmission 
or acquisition of COVID virus. So therefore, it's important to remember that even if you are vaccinated, you could still potentially transmit the disease because you could potentially still catch or harbor the coronavirus. You just won't get sick from it to a large degree of statistical certainty. So therefore, I always remind anybody who's been vaccinated, wear your mask. I'm not wearing it now because I'm isolated here in the back of my office. I'm not interacting with any patients at this point. But when I do go out and interact with patients at one o'clock, I'm gonna be wearing a mask. It's very important that you constantly wash your hands to prevent transmission uh, of the COVID virus from fingertips or surfaces to your face, which is typically the point of entry. Uh, and it's also very, very important uh, that we maintain uh, social distancing, extremely important. Now, one of the questions that I always get is, well, now that I'm vaccinated, can I go and have dinner with my friends in a restaurant or at their house? And the current CDC recommendation is it's okay to meet with a small group of family and friends in a small setting, a small restaurant table, a dining room table at someone's house, certainly an outdoor venue would be the best of all, but it's okay to meet with them unmasked, assuming that everybody is vaccinated. So if you're going to go visit Cousin Emily at her house this coming Sunday because she's having a brunch and she's not vaccinated, well, at that point, the best recommendation is everybody should maintain masking and obviously that event should be held outdoors. Now, if Cousin Emily is having a small intimate dinner, party of six at her house because she's going to try out her, her new uh, shrimp scampi recipe on you, if she's not vaccinated, it's probably best to wear a mask or take a pass and say, Cousin Emily, I'll meet you at the Olive Garden. We'll get shrimp scampi there. At this point in time, meeting with friends and family, indoors, closed setting, without a mask, should be restricted to everybody who has their vaccine. If everybody at the table is not vaccinated, then that's not really a safe environment for that person who is at that indoor dining table who is unmasked. So I'm still recommending that unless everybody is masked in your social pod, continue to maintain social distancing, continue to maintain masking, and you can only take off the masks once everyone is vaccinated and assuming that you're still dealing with a small group. So the big buffet lines without masking, uh, the all-you-can-eat uh, Chinese uh, buffet uh, at, at the restaurant, uh, that's not going to happen to my patients or to myself, assuming that everybody in there is not masked. So at this point in time, it's important to ask your friends, hey, have you had a vaccine? Because I'd love to come to your house this coming Saturday to try your shrimp scampi, but unless everybody's vaccinated, I'm gonna still have to wear a mask and I'm still gonna have to social distance. And these are important questions and I think they're appropriate questions and there's no disrespect intended. Uh, people need to understand that it's okay to reopen the social setting assuming that everyone is vaccinated. And if everyone is not vaccinated, then we continue with masking, social distancing, and we should always wash our hands anyway because hand washing is the best thing you should do. And I've done it my whole life and I'll do it till my dying day. And in the Jewish religion, even after you're dead, they still wash your hands and your body. So hand washing is, is, a, is a lifelong uh, opportunity of hygiene and then an even after death opportunity of hygiene. So there's nothing better than hand washing to maintain transmission uh, of potential uh, vaccine particles, I'm sorry, of potential viral particles uh, to your face, uh, which is, as I said, the point of entry. Now, one of the issues that so many people ask me is, well, how is it that the vaccine can protect disease, but it's still not protecting your ability to carry, harbor the virus in your nose or mouth or transmit the COVID virus? And, and that's a very interesting question. And what we think is going on is the vaccine is given intramuscularly in the shoulder, left or right. Uh, and at that point of intramuscular entry, what is happen happening is your body is making immune globulins and uh, lymphocytes against the COVID virus. 
but it's not making any immune globulin A. Immune globulin A is the immune globulin that resides in the nasal and the oral cavities. And that prevents you from getting sick from anything that happens to wash up in your nose or end up in your mouth. So immune globulin A is, is our first line of defense against things that attack our face. Uh, but we, we think that the vaccine does a very good job of making IgG and IgM, uh, the long-acting and the short-acting immune globulins that are in our bloodstream, but it may not do a very good job of IgA uh, manufacturing. I mean, it's not going to stimulate IgA, and IgA is what resides in our nasal passages and in our mouth to prevent point of entry uh, of the COVID virus. So vaccines may not do a very good job of IgA, which is our first line of nasal oral pharyngeal defense, but the vaccines do a really great job of IgG and IgM defense. So that's what's probably think, that's the theory about, pro, about having us get ill from the COVID. And again, that is the efficacy endpoint of the vaccines. So the whole idea of taking a vaccine is, is that you're not gonna get sick, hospitalized or die from COVID. So that's what the vaccines are geared to do. And it does make sense in terms of how they stimulate uh, that you may be able to continue to transmit COVID virus even though you're fully vaccinated. And, and that's because the IgA may not be up to full force to prevent attack of that virus in the nasal passage or in the uh, oral cavity. And at that point, you <coughs> cough or sneeze on somebody, boom, you can transmit the virus even though you're not going to get sick because you've been vaccinated. So recapping, Vaccine is a great way to prevent illness, but at this point, it's not quite clear how effective it is in preventing transmission. And that is why everybody should be vaccinated. That way you won't get sick. But on the other hand, uh, we still need to maintain all of those preventative measures, social distancing, hand washing, uh, and, and facial masking to prevent the uh, transmission a virus, and that's why I'm somewhat astounded that these states are are lowering their uh, mask policy. Uh, first of all, even if the population has been vaccinated, the majority of the population hasn't been vaccinated, and with masking uh, taken away, that then you're increasing your risk of transmission. So none of that makes sense. There's nothing cheaper than a mask, and at this point in time, we're all used to wearing it. So what the heck is the difference anyway? Uh, you hang it off your ear, you throw it around your chin. What difference does it make? Just wear the damn mask and, and prevent transmission uh, of the virus if perhaps you are uh, carrying it. So let's talk about the differentiation between the three vaccines. So the first two that were out of the bag uh, were Pfizer and Moderna, uh, and they work very similarly. Those vaccines are, uh, they contain a, a bit of messenger RNA, which is a little bit of ribonucleic acid, and that strand of messenger RNA uh, tells your cells to make spike proteins, coronavirus spike proteins. So they inject that messenger RNA. Uh, it goes into your muscle cells here. The muscle cells see this RNA, this ribonucleic acid, and they say, okay, time to make some coronavirus spike proteins. And that's what they do. And by pumping out those spike proteins, your body recognizes it and says, wait a second, this is not anything I've seen before. This is a foreign invader. So your body then makes antibodies and lymphocytic cells against the spike proteins. And that's how the Moderna and the Pfizer uh, vaccines work very similarly uh, to prevent getting ill uh, from coronavirus because once those vaccines are in your body, uh, approximately four weeks later after your second vaccine, you have a uh, good immune response uh, against the spike proteins of the coronavirus. So if a real coronavirus shows up with those spike proteins, then boom, your body's already been taught to view that as a foreign invader and attack. Uh, and I can say that even though there are variations of coronavirus, which are now coming out, you've heard about the mutations, the variations, uh, that the vaccines still seem to be doing a very robust job of preventing illness, even with uh, the mutations. And, and people have to say, oh my goodness, why is this mutating? Does this mean that this is something strange? No. Whenever you have an epidemic where lots and lots and lots of people are harboring 
a virus, at that point, you have the capacity for the virus to mutate because it's picking up uh, different DNA from adjacent viruses. So this, this mutational assortment is a common phenomenon uh, in, all, uh, in, in all infections, viral and bacterial. So it, it's not surprising at all uh, that coronavirus has mutated. Uh, but the good news is the vaccine, the Pfizer, the Moderna, and now the J&J &J seem to be very good against all of these vaccines. And, uh, and as I've said before, uh, the coronavirus has gone from an endemic, I'm sorry, from a pandemic, meaning affecting everywhere suddenly, to an endemic. This virus is going to be with us. So your vaccine that you're getting tomorrow, uh, get in line for the same thing probably again uh, 12 months from now, because this virus is now part of our part of our biome, part of our uh, life uh, habitat, and we're going to be looking at probably booster vaccines going on an annual basis, just like we do with the flu vaccine, because the flu mutates, so annually you get an updated flu shot. And I can say the coronavirus mutates, so annually you're going to be getting an updated uh, coronavirus uh, shot. So let's talk about uh, the Pfizer and Moderna virus uh, vaccinations. Those are messenger RNA. They're encapsulated in a little bit of a fat particle, lipid particle, and then it's injected. And with that, your muscle cells say, hey, time to make some spike proteins, and they do. And as a result of making that spike protein, the spikes go into the... Uh, bloodstream and your bloodstream says, wait a second, I've never seen this before. And that's when they make the uh, antibodies and the T lymphocytes. That's how the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccines work. Because it's messenger RNA, which is what's stimulating the manufacture of the spike protein, messenger RNA is extremely delicate. It's a small strand, obviously uh, nanoparticle, it falls apart very easily. That's why the Pfizer and Moderna viruses have to be shipped and manufactured under extremely cold temperatures because those, the components of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, basically messenger RNA, is so fragile that it must be kept at extremely cold temperature. And that has always been the drawback of the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, that it has to be shipped super cold, minus 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And then once you thaw it, ready for administration, you better give it. And if you don't give it, it has to be discarded. And that's why I've run into a lot of people under the age of 65 that said, hey, I just managed to show up at this vaccine site. They were getting ready to close at seven o'clock. So I showed up at quarter to seven. They had some open uh, vaccines that hadn't been accounted for, hadn't been used. So I said, please inject me. And, and, and that's the best thing you can do. The leftovers are oftentimes distributed to folks under age 65. So I always recommend that if you're under 65 and you don't have any uh, risk factors that allow you to be vaccinated early, just show up at the last minute at one of these vaccine centers. Typically they close at 7 p.m. Uh, and say, hey, look, if there's any leftover, could you give me a jab? And I can tell you a lot of people that I've talked to have already had this opportunity. So it's a wonderful thing. So that's a phenomenon of the Pfizer Moderna vaccinations because those vaccines have to be kept under cold, uh, very cold circumstances. And once that, that vial is opened, that medicine has to be given very quickly. So they can't hold it over another night. So that's why it may be worth your while if you want the vaccine just to show up at 6.30, quarter to seven and say, here I am. Um, I know I don't have any specific risk factors and I don't have a specific appointment, but if you've got some no-shows for people who were scheduled, hey, I'll be in line at quarter to seven to get my vaccine. And I can tell you a lot of people that I know have actually been vaccinated on that basis, folks under age 65. So it's very worthwhile to almost uh, scope out where the vaccination sites are. And if there's one that's not too far from your family, or if you think it's in an area uh, that may be underutilized, then just scope it out and maybe drive over there, 6.30, quarter to seven, and see what happens. And you may have the good opportunity of being vaccinated with the remainder that hasn't been called for. So uh, that, that's a very, very important uh, logistical type of, of trick that I, I've seen occur more and more frequently. So that's the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine. Uh, so that's what was 
only available up until this past Saturday. So the reason why we're doing our, our Facebook Live today, Wednesday, March 3, is because this past weekend, the J&J &J vaccine was FDA approved for emergency use. So what's the difference between the J&J &J and the Pfizer? Well, the J&J &J doesn't use that cold chain messenger RNA technology. It does not use that. The cold chain messenger chain technology is really within the Pfizer and the Moderna realm. And that's a very good technology, make no mistake, because anytime you come up with a new vaccine, with a new virus mutation, they can just go in and tweak that messenger RNA to spit out a new vaccine that is responsive to the new mutation. So it's very quick. Uh, you can substitute very easily messenger RNA uh, strands. And with that, they can create a new vaccine for a completely new viral mutation. So, so that's why Pfizer Moderna vaccine technology is gonna be with us now and for the foreseeable future. How does that differ from the J&J &J vaccine? Well, the J&J &J vaccine is not using messenger RNA. It's actually using uh, viral DNA, COVID viral DNA, inserting that DNA into an adenovirus, which is a common virus that infects all of us. So what they're actually doing with the J&J &J vaccine is they're taking coronavirus DNA, injecting it and creating uh, a customized adenovirus, uh, adenovirus, which is, they're all over the place. Adenoviruses aren't uh, toxic to humans because they've been with us for millions of years and they're basically part of our biome. We've all been exposed to adenoviruses. So what happens is the folks at J&J &J inject that uh, coronavirus DNA into the adenovirus, giving the adenovirus a component of coronavirus as part of its genetic makeup. The adenovirus is then injected in a single jab, kept at room temperature. So now you're already understanding what are the potential benefits of a J&J &J vaccine. You can ship it to Mongolia, you can ship it to Africa, those folks there who may not have access to extreme cold chain storage can use the vaccine because it, it can be kept and, and delivered at room temp. Uh, and that vaccine now is injected with that virus. Your body looks at that virus and says, okay, uh, that's not normal because as it starts to destroy the virus, parts of the virus which code for the coronavirus spike protein are all seen as uh, abnormal invaders. So your body is now making antibodies against the adenovirus components, which have been genetically modified to have coronavirus stuff. So that's the technology behind the J&J &J vaccine. Now, a lot of folks have said, well, I don't want the J&J &J vaccine. I want the Pfizer vaccine or I want the Moderna vaccine because the J&J &J vaccine is maybe only 75% effective and the Pfizer vaccine is 95% effective. So I'd rather have the J&J, &J, I'd rather have the Pfizer vaccine. Well, first of all, my philosophy is the best vaccine for you is the one you can get today. And the reason why the efficacy in terms of disease prevention of the J&J &J vaccine may not be as high as Pfizer and Moderna products is because Pfizer and Moderna products were tested early on in the time frame of the global pandemic. So we didn't have all these mutations out there when the Pfizer and Moderna trials were underway. So rather than say that the J&J &J vaccine is less effective or less efficacious, it's very effective in presenting, preventing disease. I would rather say it was developed at a later point in time where we have more coronavirus mutations than we did back in April or May when the Pfizer and Moderna uh, trials were underway. So there's more mutations. So the J&J &J vaccine was tested under a more challenging circumstance. It was ch tested during a time when we had more mutations. So that's why the comparative efficacy between the J&J &J and Pfizer and Moderna may not be exactly the same, but you're kind of comparing apples and oranges. You're kind of comparing an apple trial to an orange trial. So with that being said, the J&J &J vaccine, if it, if it had been uh, available back in May or June when the uh, Pfizer and Moderna trials were underway, 
it could have the exact same efficacy. But remember, the, the landscape, the situation of COVID pandemic is a little bit different today in March of 2021 than it was in May and June of 2020. So always be careful when you're comparing efficacy amongst different drugs, amongst different treatments, because you wanna make sure that the disease is exactly the same, and you also wanna make sure that the population is exactly the same. So therefore, again, I'm gonna state it over and over, the best vaccine for you is the one you can get at this very moment. Uh, they are all good, they are all extraordinarily effective in preventing coronavirus-related hospitalization, disease, and death. And in fact, in the J&J &J, uh, trials, no one died. No one died from coronavirus in the J&J &J trial. So we are dealing with slightly different vaccine technologies. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna are using messenger RNA that's injected directly into the muscle cells to make spike proteins that are then triggering the immune system to respond, coronavirus spike proteins. And the J&J &J virus is actually tweaking, I'm sorry, the J&J &J vaccine is actually tweaking an adenovirus, a very common virus that's in our environment, it's tweaking that, vac that virus so that when that, vac when that virus goes into our body and is seen by the muscle cells and starts to make other similar types of adenoviruses and then they get chewed up, the outburst uh, of that chew up phenomenon is the coronavirus spike protein, which has been incorporated into the adenovirus DNA. Uh, and at that point, your body views it as a foreign intruder, so it gives you more of those antibodies against the spike protein. Good news about the J&J &J virus, uh, the J&J &J vaccine, is it's a single shot, and it's storable uh, at, at customary temperatures that can be kept in any doctor's office, any uh, pharmacy, any clinic, basically any firehouse. So in terms of rolling out uh, the vaccine, probably the J&J &J is the easiest one to roll out, not only on a national basis, but, but maybe on an international basis. Because remember, just because we're all vaccinated here in the U.S., if folks in Uganda and, and South Africa and Egypt are not vaccinated, well, that virus is, mutations are just going to come right back and, and land on our doorstep once again. So vaccine only works in a setting of global vaccination. So make sure you understand that concept. And that's why it's extremely important that when people get together, everybody needs to be vaccinated because that's what prevents the transmission and probable mutation uh, arise uh, of the COVID. Let's talk about the side effects. If you look at the overall uh, side effects between the Moderna uh, and the Pfizer vaccine, uh, process, the side effects are very similar. At the time of injection, a little bit of uh, focal irritation, maybe some redness, maybe some soreness. That's good. That means that the vaccine is stimulating your muscle cells to make something inflammatory. Inflammation means immune response, so that's a good sign. Uh, oftentimes, there's even a more robust response on the booster shot of the Pfizer and the Moderna. And again, it's called a booster for a reason because it once again revs up that immune system. So redness, irritation, uh, soreness, perhaps a little bit of headache, a little bit of fatigue. Again, this is all your body's way of saying, okay, immune system is uh, on attack now, uh, making my antibodies and lymphocytes. So side effect profile from Moderna, Pfizer, very, very similar. Uh, nothing statistically different that's been shown in any of the clinical trials between those two. And the J&J &J side effect is also, uh, again, local redness, a little bit of soreness, uh, a little bit of malaise, maybe some fatigue on the day or the day following the uh, vaccination. Uh, but so far, nothing that would warrant us to be walking around with EpiPens or premedicate, premedicate with uh, steroids or, or Tylenol. Uh, my philosophy is a vaccine needs to be taken by everyone. Uh, that we should not overthink the process because the science is compelling, the science is good, the efficacy data is good. Get the vaccine, take the vaccine, uh, and then uh, if you're having any achiness or soreness, try and tough it out. I mean, 
and, and if that doesn't work, you can always resort to two Tylenol. But these people that call about, should I premedicate with steroids and EpiPen and, and Tylenol and Advil, all of this, I think, is, is unnecessary aggravation, unnecessary concern because the side effect data is, is very good uh, with all of these vaccines. So if you're having severe pain from a vaccine, uh, take a little Tylenol, take a little uh, Aleve or Advil. This too will pass. Uh, and it, it's, it's a side effect burden that I think is well worth having in light of the significant benefit that you're going to get from the vaccine in preventing death, hospitalization, and disability from COVID. And I can tell you as a neurologist, each and every day, we basically are running a long haul COVID clinic in this very office to deal with the persistent neurologic uh, problems associated with COVID. And I am seeing everything from seizures to stroke to nerve pain to vertigo to persistent loss of smell and taste to uh, muscle aches. So I can tell you that in this office, if you don't believe that COVID can have significant problems down the road, then just come into my office and see what we're dealing with every day. Uh, so on that note, I am a huge advocate of vaccination, as is pretty much every other doctor right now on planet Earth. One question from Martin about shingles. Uh, shingles vaccination is important because folks who have had coronavirus and who get coronavirus are susceptible to recurrence of shingles if they've had it. So I'm a big advocate of the shingles vaccine as well. My philosophy is get your COVID vaccine first uh, and then uh, wait about a, a couple of months after you've had your COVID vaccine uh, and then go and get your shingles vaccine. If you don't anticipate having a COVID vaccine in the foreseeable future, remember, you can get your shingle shot today. That's widely available. You have to be over age 50 because that's where it's approved. Uh, but then if you want to get your COVID vaccine, you're going to have to wait two weeks. Uh, so my thinking is if you think you're going to have quick access to the COVID vaccine, hold off on your shingles vaccination. If you've already had your COVID vaccine and you've been beyond the two shots and you're feeling okay, then I think it's it's a great idea to get the shingles vaccine because that'll be another visit into the office of Dr. Gelblum uh, after my uh, COVID long haul clinic. We can come in and talk about my post herpetic neuralgia uh, shingles clinic because we see those patients all the time. So the good news is we live in really great times. Yes, it's kind of sad and, and rather distressing that we had a COVID pandemic, but we're going to be seeing pandemics going forward. It's the nature of planet Earth. Uh, viruses pop up. They've been with us for millions of years and they'll be around far longer than humanity will be around. Uh, and with that being said, we've got the great technology now that can get these vaccines out quickly, safely, uh, and effectively get the vaccines out. The only problem is the logistical vaccination, and that's a political problem. I'm not going to talk about that today, uh, but the politics of vaccination are something that are just mind-boggling to me as a physician. So I'm happy to talk to you about vaccines. I'm happy to talk to you about vaccination safety, but I'm not going to weigh in on the problems with vaccination rollout because for that, you're going to have to call your congressman. And on that note, I'm going to wish you a great afternoon. I appreciate your uh, watching today, uh, and I hope that I was helpful in answering your questions. Uh, question. Uh, Mary has a question real quick. How long after your second vaccine should you get this shingle shot? I would recommend, Mary, wait about four weeks after your second vaccine. Let, her, let the immune system settle down uh, and then go get your vaccination for shingles. And you will thank me on that as well. And that's one vaccine. And then you're going to repeat within the next six months, between two and six months for the second vaccine. Okay, everyone, uh, wishing you a great afternoon. Happy vaccination. Go get your vaccine. And if you don't feel that you're going to be in line anytime soon to get the vaccine, just call one of these places on a Sunday afternoon, show up at around 6.30, 6.45, and good luck uh, might actually uh, strike your way. Okay, everyone, have a great afternoon. Thank you.